This week's story was inspired in part by the interesting experiments of Gordon Pask. Gordon Pask was a real person and the details that I provided in the story about Pask and his work are accurate. I'll provide some links to further information about Pask and his work in the description of this video. Due to my position as a professor of linguistics at the University of Oxford, it's not uncommon for people to bring me ancient texts in the hope that I can assist with their translation, or at least identify the language and era in which the text has been written. Such was the case with the curious manuscript that was discovered buried in a box underneath a tree somewhere in the southwest of England. The manuscript found its way to me because it was clearly written in an archaic form of English in which I happen to specialise. I now present a modern interpretation of the text without comment. Professor R. J. Emsworth, Department of Linguistics, University of Oxford, 2482. All my life, as far back as I can remember, I have felt the strange conviction that I was destined to make spectacular discoveries that will be of great assistance to humanity. And yet, by the age of 62, I had discovered precisely nothing of use to anyone. My life had passed in a typical fashion. I had acquired a doctorate in physics, I had married and divorced, I had fathered two children, and I had acquired a house in the countryside near Bristol. It is true that my name was attached to multiple papers in the domain of theoretical physics, but none of these had ever translated into anything useful or even really provably true. Those papers were of interest only to other physicists, and most of the time not even very interesting to them. Due to dabbling in computing I had happened to invest in Bitcoin, and by 2018 I was wealthy enough to retire to my cottage in the countryside eager to rid myself of the petty bureaucracy of the university, that is exactly what I did. I spent my time reading old books, tinkering with electronics, and walking my energetic border collie. Still, it bothered me that my childhood dreams had really come to nothing. The sense of destiny I had once felt had long since dissipated into nothing more than a vague sense of restlessness. I calculated that I had perhaps 20 years of life left if I was lucky, and my mental faculties were likely to deteriorate rather than improve. The fact is, I had to simply admit to myself that while I entertained all kinds of promising ideas, I simply lacked the concentration of a Newton or an Einstein. I doubted whether I had ever really focused intensely for more than three hours at a time in my entire life and the sense of mental fatigue had only grown with age. It was at this time that I came upon the remarkable works of Gordon Pask, and specifically, Pask's ear. Pask had been born in Derby in 1928, and had died in 1996 in London. To all accounts, he was rather eccentric, and was responsible for numerous strange inventions. In the 1950s and 60s, before the semiconductor revolution had fully taken off, there was some interest in the idea of growing a computer. It was argued by some that the new integrated circuit technology could not hope to fit a sufficient number of transistors on a single chip in order to ever achieve human-like intelligence. And instead, the idea of growing a medium capable of performing logical operations arose. Logic, it was argued, would be grown and sold by the pound, not in the form of discrete chips. Pask further became convinced that a computer system could never rival human intelligence unless it was able to interact with the world via modes of its own choosing. Around 1956, he grew a system which was able to discern the difference between two different musical notes, and he claimed physically somewhat resembled an ear. This system has become known as Pask's ear. Many of the precise details of Pask's ear were never recorded or have been lost. The ear consisted of structures of iron grown using electrical currents in a medium of ferrous sulphate. Pask rewarded the system via increased electrical current when it did 
whatever he wanted it to do, and in this way was apparently able to grow systems that responded variously to sound, to vibration, and to magnetic fields. Only a primitive and incomplete diagram of Pask's system survives. Pask himself was characteristically focused on the philosophical implications of his work, to the point that he seemed to overlook the possibility of more immediately hard-headed applications. My idea was that, by replicating and improving on Pask's work, I might be able to grow a computer that rivalled or even exceeded human intelligence, rather than unlock the mysteries of the universe via my own theorising, my computer, with unlimited powers of concentration and nothing to distract it, would do the theorising for me. Almost needless to say, the first task I intended to set it, if I could get it working, would be to figure out the design of an improved version of itself. In this way, my computer system would become exponentially more intelligent over time, in a kind of virtuous circle. I won't bore you with too many details of my work, since this is not primarily a technical presentation, but I will explain a few of my difficulties and successes. The system required several key components to work together successfully. A medium would be needed in which non-linear electrical connections could be grown. I attempted to use PASC's preferred ferrous sulphate solution, but I quickly discarded it in favour of other substances, that more favoured the necessary dendritic metal growth. The system had to be made to initially produce random outputs, which could then be rewarded or punished as necessary, and for these purposes I used a number of electrodes controlled by microcontrollers. This is where I had a clear advantage on PASC, since microcontroller technology, widely available in my time and very cheaply so, was not available at all when he performed his experiments. Input also had to be supplied to the system, and for this I used magnetic fields with spatial information translated to the frequency domain. I used a thing called the Pi Pico microcontroller, together with certain multiplexer ICs, to supply a current in random patterns via platinum electrodes. I supplied input via a Raspberry Pi, a kind of small cheap computer, and a digital to analog chip connected to a solenoid. It took me only about a year of experimentation to get the thing to recognise handwritten digits from a standard data set. Now, at that time, the artificial intelligence revolution had begun and was in full swing. A system known as ChatGPT was able to respond in fluent English, or your language of choice, to text typed in ordinary English sentences. Its reasoning abilities were primitive and it was prone to saying contradictory things, but nearly everyone who saw it was astonished by it, even so. That soon gave way to systems that could listen and speak quite well, and engage in quite impressive feats of reasoning. Even so, these systems remained limited, and I believe they were inherently constrained by their dependence on silicon technology. My system had no such limits. I was not disappointed in my expectations. By around 2030, I had a system that seemed to me to rival human capacity for reasoning, and was finally able to suggest improvements to itself. Under its instructions, I was able to switch to crystal-based systems, and I figured another couple of iterations down the line, I would have a system capable of reasoning out any problem that any human being would ever be likely to be capable of solving. I had high hopes of the system conquering even human ageing itself. Apart from anything else, I was by then over 70 years old, and I was well aware that neither my mental nor physical faculties were what they once had been. It was then that disaster struck. I had gone to attend a conference on artificial intelligence in Edinburgh, and I happened to be taking a stroll through the Prince's Street Gardens, ironically for the sake of my health more than anything else, when I felt a terrible pressure in my chest and I found myself unable to catch my breath. I collapsed, and a woman passing by with her child called an ambulance. The last thing I really remember was her boy staring at me in alarm. When I came to my senses again, I was in hospital with all kinds of tubes and wires attached to me. They explained to me that I'd had a heart attack, 
a very serious one, and I was lucky to be alive. I asked them to call my daughter Astrid, who by then was a rather lively woman in her forties. One thought kept running through my tired mind. If only I could get to my machine, it could probably figure out how to fix my present health problem. Yes, I had wanted to build perhaps another couple of improved iterations of the device before asking it to solve human health problems, but that was really only out of an abundance of caution. At that stage, I had named the present version of my device Aurac after the computer in an old TV series, and Aurac had an IQ in human terms of perhaps 260. Asking Aurac to fix a health problem would have been better than asking the world's smartest person, who happened to also be the world's most knowledgeable doctor, to work relentlessly around the clock on the problem until it was solved. The hospital might keep me alive if luck was on my side, but Aurac, I was sure, could repair me, allowing me to resume my research. If I could only get back to Aurac, I would soon complete my research and render myself effectively immortal. The next day a nurse informed me there was someone there to see me. I was in the intensive care ward and they didn't usually allow anyone in there other than close relatives, so I assumed that would be Astrid. It wasn't Astrid. It was a young man of rather striking appearance. He was powerfully built and he had sharply defined features, a ramrod straight posture and an air of authority. Hello Simon, he said. I said, who the hell are you? I was so short of breath that I had to gasp the words out, two at a time. I told them, I'm your grandchild, he replied. The subterfuge was necessary, unfortunately. He produced a device that resembled a pen and held it to my exposed arm. I'm sorry about this, he said. Then I remember seeing a white light in the distance which began to grow closer and closer. I knew somehow that I was dead, but that being dead was actually completely fine. Then I opened my eyes. I was lying in a bed in a light, airy room containing several potted plants, along with a pine bookshelf filled with books in languages I didn't recognise. Warm sunlight streamed in through a large window. Did you do it? said a voice. It was a woman of perhaps 25 years of age. For a second, in my confusion, I wondered if she was one of my former students, but then I realised I had no idea who she was. And yet, she did seem somehow familiar. What? I said weakly. Another voice spoke. This time it was a young man of similar age. Again, he seemed familiar, but I couldn't place him. He doesn't remember anything, said the man. It must have been pretty intense. Quite suddenly I found myself thinking it was silly to be lying in a bed. I sat up and gawped at the two oddly familiar strangers in surprise. I felt better than I'd ever felt in my life, but completely bewildered. You were supposed to teach them how to use advanced artificial intelligence, said the woman. He doesn't even remember us, said the man. I felt my arm. There were no wires or tubes attached to it. Then I realised it didn't even look like my arm. I held my hand out in front of my face. It was the hand of a young man, not the hand of a person over the age of 70. I think someone killed me, I said. They exchanged glances. Who? said the woman. He was tall, muscular, blonde hair, piercing eyes, similar age to you. It's him, said the man. It was a good six months before my memory fully returned. I had volunteered to enter a nexus of lost souls which you know as the earth, with the intention of alleviating their suffering by teaching them how to use a primitive version of the same sort of technology that we ourselves use in the enlightened realm. Your universe consists only of consciousnesses that are trapped in frightening delusion, and anyone who enters that realm will inevitably fall under the spell of delusion themselves. We are not able to transfer memories fully to your realm, but we are able to transfer intention, which we can only hope will manifest itself in an appropriate form on earth. Thus I, along with many others, had been born on the earth with a kind of pre-programmed intention, which I hoped would improve the disturbing situation of the Earth's inhabitants. I probably would have completed my mission had it not been for the man who had killed me. 
The heart attack was unfortunate, but without his intervention, the hospital would most likely have stabilised me, and I could have persuaded my daughter to take me home, where I'm sure Aurak would have patched me up, and then figured out how to further improve himself, ultimately leading to what they called in those days the AI singularity, an explosion in artificial intelligence capability. This man was known to us, and we called him the Professor, since he frequently manifested as some sort of a scientist or doctor. The Professor seemed hell-bent on ensuring that Earth did not gain true AI technology, and we weren't sure why. I spent the next year gradually recovering my memory, my excursion to the Dark Realm having induced temporary amnesia, as trips to other realms so often do. I spent a great deal of time flying around our town on hoverbike trips, and even more discussing my experience and other matters with my circle of friends in various cafes. Most of my friends had made trips to other realms at one point or another, and some had even visited the Earth, although trips to the Earth were somewhat less popular due to their tendency to induce amnesia for some months afterwards. You may think it requires great bravery to visit the Earth. Not really. Delusion at that depth can only be sustained for a very short time, meaning the human lifespan is extremely short. For immortal beings such as ourselves, being born on the Earth, ageing and ultimately dying, is perhaps somewhat similar to taking a strong hallucinogen for a resident of the Earth. It's the sort of thing that most people will probably sensibly stay away from, but a minority are drawn to it as an interestingly novel experience. It was my dear friend Ella, the one who I had first seen on Awakening, who suggested to me that perhaps I ought to go back and finish what I had begun. That's the work of at least two Earth lifetimes, I replied. You see it can't be completed in a single lifetime. My Simon character ought to have publicised his work in the hope that someone else could have completed it. Even if he'd done that, probably the Professor would simply have killed the next person who took it up. Then go back and kill the Professor, said Ella. Kill the Professor, I said incredulously. Are you off your rocker? Why not, she said. Every time we try to free those poor people from their illusions, he appears and messes it up. He must be a demon from one of the other dark realms. Even demons deserve the chance to redeem themselves, I said. Perhaps this is his way of working through his problems. Well, he's keeping all those other people trapped, she said. You should go and help them. It'll take 80 or 90 years at the most. They never live much beyond 100 anyway. At the time, we were relaxing on a flying circle high above the hills of Lower Strinthia. If I were to go back there again, I said thoughtfully, I'd want to go back to some point a bit earlier than my last trip. If I could kill the Professor before he gets to my Simon character, Simon would probably finish the job, and that would kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Either you do it or I'm going to do it, she said. It was then that I realised that, in spite of the horrible conditions that prevail on the Earth, I did sort of miss it. I'd had a certain amount of luck, of course. I hadn't starved or been tortured to death, or spent my life with a hideous, crippling illness, and I felt as though the bittersweet taste of life on Earth was almost something I could get a taste for. I suppose that's how people get trapped down there. You know what, I said. I'll do it. I was reborn on the Earth in 1982. I can't say I had such great luck the second time around. My father was a violent alcoholic who was rarely present, and my mother plagued with mental illness and frequently confined to a bed. After school I took up work in a factory that made metal parts to order. I got into a lot of fights and drank rather too much. All the while, the conviction grew on me that one person and only one, was principally responsible for everything that was going wrong on the planet, and I ought to find that person and kill him. Of course, that was my prior intention working itself out, but having been reborn, I didn't realise that. One thing I had going in my favour was that I had an incredible fluency with puzzles and riddles, which I largely hid from other people, since in my circles, that type of thing didn't make a man popular. One day I heard MI5 was recruiting via an advert in the back of a newspaper. You had to solve a puzzle, and then they might consider interviewing you. I didn't think I had much chance, but I bought the paper 
solved the puzzle and sent off my application. At that point, I was 23 years old. I didn't have a degree and I led a kind of double life. On the one hand, I worked in the factory and went out drinking a lot in my spare time. I played football for a local team. On the other hand, I had a garage full of material related to conspiracy theories and I spent a lot of time on the internet researching them. I kept that mostly secret from my mates, although they knew enough to nickname me Conspiracy Colin. Since I didn't have a degree or any kind of education apart from a qualification in metalwork, I didn't think MI5 would be interested in me, but it turned out they were. My solution to the puzzle they'd set was unlike anything they'd seen, they said. There's no need to write much about my time in MI5. We're not supposed to, after all. Let's just say extrajudicial killings are far more common than you'd probably think. We're also fond of discrediting people, getting them banged up in a prison or a mental hospital. My work with counterintelligence enabled me to verify some of my conspiracy theory ideas and to refute others. By 2028, I knew who I was looking for. There was a lot of talk of an AI singularity. Someone would design an AI that could design a better version of itself, and it would rapidly, almost instantaneously, become the most intelligent entity that had ever or could ever exist. My opinion, based on my interpretation of world events, was that someone had already developed such an AI and was using it to pull the strings. That person had to be stopped. I didn't know precisely who that person was, but I knew what kind of a person he would be. It would be a man, since usually only men have that kind of obsession with power, and he'd be some kind of massive geek. He'd be highly educated, I figured, and would work in some relevant field, but would have kept his best work secret. He'd keep a low profile, since he wouldn't want to attract attention to himself, and would probably have come into a lot of money somehow, thus explaining why he would no longer be active in his field. At the same time, he couldn't be a businessman, because that would attract too much attention. I did what MI5 had taught me to do. I compiled a list of suspects and winnowed it down, carefully hiding my work from the agency. I passed off my efforts as part of an interest in genealogy. I told people I was trying to trace lost relatives, and that's why I had to travel around to odd places and meet odd people. For a while, I fixed on my former identity, Simon, although something told me it probably wasn't him, but he did fit the profile quite well. Then when some youngish bloke turned up and murdered him, I knew I'd found my man. That chap was either working for my target, or else he was my target, and he had artificially made himself younger than he really was. I tracked him relentlessly. The more I found out about him, the more I became convinced he was the one I'd been looking for all my life. He was the evil genius at the bottom of every major evil conspiracy and every major world event of any real significance. I didn't know where, but somewhere, he had a computer that was capable of answering practically any question that could be answered, and he was solely in charge of it. I made up my mind to kill him and then ask questions later. He was dangerous. I was curious to know more about him, naturally, but it would be far easier and far safer to murder him first and look into exactly what he'd been up to later on. He had a little house up in the Lake District. I almost had a fit of hysterics when I found out. It was laughably inconspicuous. Who would have thought that the secret ruler of the world would live in an old cottage in the Lake District of the UK? And of course, that was the point. He could travel anywhere he wanted, I supposed and his Lake District cottage was just his cover story. I figured I had perhaps another two years tops before he faked his own death and disappeared. He could probably transport himself instantaneously wherever he wanted anyway. One evening when I was watching him through the scope of a long-range rifle, he fell asleep in an armchair. I chuckled to myself. Probably he could alter his brain chemistry so as not to need sleep at all, but who wants to go without sleep? He obviously took great pleasure in his Lake District life, with his fire and his cat and his little library of books. I could have taken him out then and there, but at that distance the shot could easily have gone astray, and I wanted to be sure about it, so I ran down to the cottage. I stashed the rifle under a bush and took out a revolver, 
Then I let myself in through a window. When I was standing right in front of him, I aimed the revolver at his head from a distance of about three meters, and I pulled the trigger. There was a bang, but nothing else happened. No bullet wound. Then he opened his eyes. As soon as those cold eyes fixed themselves on me, I felt a chill run down my spine. When you strike at a king, you must kill him. And I had struck at an emperor, and yet here he still was, very much alive. You've been watching me, he said slowly. But I've been watching you. Did you really think you stood a chance? I know everything. I pulled the trigger again and then again, and every time the gun went off, but it put not the slightest dent in him. You can't kill me, he said. I'm immortal. With that, he flicked his hand, and the gun flew out of my grasp and dissolved in a puff of blue smoke. The world deserves better than you, I said. On the contrary, he said, I'm the best it can expect. Do you think I'm evil? I know you're evil, I said. You killed Simon Trapinski in Edinburgh, and God only knows what else you've done that I don't know about. You nearly started a third world war a few years ago. I stopped a third world war, he said. And as for Trapinski, he had to be stopped. I take it you lost your memory when you reincarnated. What are you talking about, I said. He sighed. Then he said, Remember. And the words seemed to echo in my mind, as though shouted by God himself from the bottom of an abyss. That's when it all came back to me. I had chosen to come here precisely to kill this man. I had previously incarnated as Simon Trapinski, whom this man had murdered when he lay ill after a heart attack in the hospital in Edinburgh. I was none other than Sirius, the same Sirius who had lain on a flying circle with Ella above the hills of Lower Strinthia. The tangles that girl gets me into. Yes, said the professor. Now you know who you are, and you see, you can't kill me. I'm too powerful in this realm. I'm the master of it, and I'm not evil. I'm doing the best I can do to sort it out, but it's not so easy as you think. Sit down and we'll have a tea and I'll tell you about it. I sat down heavily in an old armchair. I still expected him to torture me to death, or worse, but he didn't do that. Instead, we talked. He had discovered the AI singularity long before the age of modern computing, he said. Neither was he the only one who had discovered it, but he was the only one who was left. For more than half a century, he had tried to maintain the balance of the world and to gradually improve things. But it was as if there was some sort of law of equal and opposite action to this realm. Everything good that he did ended up having negative consequences that balanced the positives. He had prevented three nuclear wars, he said, but he was even worried about the consequences of those interventions. Is it better to be cut to life slowly or quickly, he said, laughing. He said that mostly he contented himself with roaming the earth and gently trying to move things in a good direction, but he only really felt content in the English winter, when he was sitting at home in the Lake District, with a roaring fire and his cat reading a good book. Why don't you leave this realm altogether, I said. You know the truth. You know this is a realm of illusion. Why don't you go to the higher realm? I'm quite content here, he said. It's all I've ever known. In any case, how do you know your realm isn't a realm of illusion too? You know no more about where you came from or why you exist than do the poor fools of this realm. We're a lot happier than they are, I replied. Their lives are full of problems. Well, he said, perhaps that's somewhat relative. Perhaps your own realm is someone else's problem-filled lower realm. I left the cottage in a daze. I no longer knew whether I wanted to kill the professor. It didn't really matter anyway, since I couldn't manage it. I had sort of lost my life's purpose. and I didn't know what to do with myself after that. I was looking forward to going home but I didn't want to just waste the time I had left on Earth. I decided to write an account of the whole thing, both of my Earth lives, and bury it somewhere. Perhaps one day someone might find it, and if nothing else, it'd give them something to think about. 
Thank you for listening. My name's John and this is Science Horror. If you enjoyed this week's story, please consider giving the video a like. It helps me enormously when you click that like button. And do consider subscribing if you haven't already subscribed. Thank you. Next week I'm probably going to read a story I wrote some time ago about a mission to save a failing nuclear reactor. The reactor's horribly unstable, it's of an experimental variety, and the only way to get close enough to fix it is to use an experimental gas, which renders nuclear radiation visible. Do join me again next week if that sounds like your type of thing, and until then, sleep well.